All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, this week's lecture, we're going to be talking about slavery and sectionalism, and we're focusing primarily on the years between 1848 um, and 1860, the immediate buildup to the Civil War. Uh, but this week also provides us with a good opportunity. We're going to have to take a, a step back. We, we missed a bit of material um, in weeks past with everything that's been going on that's really critical to understanding what's happening during this period of U.S. history. So I am going to kind of backtrack a little bit, take a look at the Missouri Compromise, um, as well as the presidency of Andrew Jackson, as that's going to have a really big impact on what's happening to Native Americans in the mid-19th century. Um, but with the rest of the lecture, we're going to be looking at events that are splitting the nation in half. Um, and really building us right up to the eve of the Civil War, um, and then turning briefly at the end of today's uh, series of mini video lectures uh, and looking at the issue of rising nativism in the United States. And what this is is primarily a reaction uh, to that wave of immigration we started talking about when we looked at industrialism, the market revolution, um, and the growth of urban centers in the Northeast in the 19th century. Um, so we have a lot to talk about, a lot to cover, and without further ado, we're going to start with the first uh, uh, major event on the lecture slides, and that is the Missouri Compromise. Um, so this is an event that's taking place um, right around the years of 1819 to 1822, finally when the Compromise would be passed. And it's really tied up with westward expansion, uh, our subject for last week. With Americans starting to more and more pass the Mississippi River and move westward, start moving out to those territories, uh, we're, America is going to have to stop and revisit this issue of slavery. Uh, most people tend to look at the issue of slavery in the 19th century as being a, a division between the North and the South. But the fact of the matter is they're not divided over slavery where it exists. Um, what the primary concern is, as America keeps moving westward, they have to decide what to do with these new territories as it pertains to slavery. In the 1820s, no one's talking about ripping slavery out of Alabama or enforcing slavery in New York. Um, and so really what it becomes about is how do we deal with these new westward territories? When they become states, are they free states or slave states? And the North and South is generally in disagreement over that issue. Um, so abolitionist sentiments have been steadily growing all throughout the 18th, late 18th and early 19th century. Um, whereas the South, after the invention of the cotton gin and the market revolution, is now more firmly cemented into this system of slavery that they're using as an economic backbone to their society. Um, so, in 1819, the Missouri Territory finally got enough people, put their state legislature together, and they applied for statehood in the Union. They wanted to become the newest state in the United States. Um, and when they did that, there was a lot of resistance from the North because they said, when we come in, we already have slaves here. Most of the people who had traveled to Missouri had come from the Deep South, um, and they had brought slaves with them. And so Missouri in 1819 says, we're ready to be a state, but when we come in, we want to be a slave state. Uh, this didn't sit so well in the North. And in particular, there's a congressman by the name of John Talmadge. Uh, he's from New York. He demands that Missouri cannot come in as a slave state. Um, of course, this is upsetting to Missouri and also the rest of the American South. Um, and Talmadge would get his resolution to pass in Congress, but he couldn't get it to pass in Senate, where there was a much larger uh, proportion of Southern uh, politicians. And so, Ultimately, there would have been a constitutional crisis as a result of this. The United States still had not tested the mechanism of how they work when one of the houses within the, the legislature says, yes, that's fine that Missouri can, can't have slavery, and the other one is saying Missouri absolutely should be allowed to have slavery. So, in order to stop this from happening, a guy named Henry Clay, a very prominent politician of the 19th century, forwards what's known as the Missouri Compromise. Under this plan, Missouri would enter the Union as a slave state, as they wanted, um, but also to balance things out in Congress and make sure that the slave states didn't get disproportional uh, representation within the American uh, legislature. Uh, they are also going to say that the newly independent state of Maine, which up until that point had been part of Massachusetts, uh, they said Maine will come in as a free state, Missouri will come in as a slave state. Therefore, we still have balance in the legislature. Uh, and then they make a plan to try to stop this problem with westward expansion moving forward, and it will work for some time. Uh, the plan is that 
they would draw an imaginary line all throughout Louisiana territory, the territory that was picked up in the Louisiana Purchase. Um, and that line would run at 36 longitude and 30 latitude. The rule moving forward will be that any state that applies for any territory that applies for statehood uh, underneath this line would come in automatically as a slave state. Slavery would be legal. Any uh, territory that applies for statehood above that line would naturally come in as a free state. And so with the Missouri Compromise, this is a very important compromise because the country, you can already see the fractures on, on where they stand with the issue of slavery. And the Missouri Compromise is going to be able to push this conversation of slavery much further down the line in American history by about three decades. Um, and when we get to the Compromise of 1850, it's going to kind of overturn um, along with the Kansas-Nebraska Act, another thing we'll be looking at today very shortly. Um, that is going to overturn this Missouri Compromise line. But for between 1822 and about 1850, the uh, law on the books that deal with slavery in the United States, it's really they're going to look back to the Missouri Compromise. If you're underneath that imaginary line, you come in as a slave state, and if you're above it, you come in as a free state. And so if you're following along in the slideshow with me, you can see where that roughly breaks down on the map. Um, there, and what's really important to sort of take a look at is this line only works in Louisiana territory. So when we start having people move further west of Louisiana territory, when they start going out to places like, oh, let's say California for the gold rush, that's going to be a major problem because the Missouri Compromise line doesn't deal with that area. It only deals with the Louisiana territory. Um, so the next issue we need to deal with before we start getting to the, the, the real bulk of our, our lectures for this week in earnest, which is slavery and sectionalism in the 1840s to the 1860s, uh, we do need to take another step back and look at Jacksonian era politics. Um, so Jackson is really a major game changer in the political scene in the 19th century. Um, and really, it's going to have a big impact on free African Americans um, and how they are being able to express their rights in the United States. Um, and it's also going to have an even larger impact on how things are going to end up with Native Americans. Um, so just a little bit of background on Andrew Jackson. He was born in Waxhaws, which uh, it's right on the border of North and South Carolina. Um, so he's firmly in a slaveholding territory is where he is born and raised. But he eventually will run for state's, uh, state office in Tennessee. He's a politician who makes his career in Tennessee, even though he's from uh, the Carolinas originally. Um, Jackson is also considered in American uh, culture a war hero. Uh, this guy is very, very famous. Uh, in the midst of the War of 1812, the British are funding a number of Native American rebellions in the U.S. Uh, South, mostly in the Southeast, like Georgia, um, Florida, those areas. Well, not so much Florida, but Georgia, on the border of Florida, Alabama, Mississippi. Um, and he's considered a war hero in the Creek War. Uh, he's down in those regions of the Southeast fighting the Creek Native Americans. Uh, he also wins a key victory at the, war, at the end of the War of 1812, what's known as the Battle of New Orleans. Um, and that is really going to uh, uh, sort of cement uh, a feeling uh, of victory for the United States coming out of the War of 1812, even though practically uh, nobody really wins that war. It kind of is fought to a draw. Um, but he also is going to be the one who puts a lot of pressure on the Spanish in Florida. A lot of the Creeks that he was fighting in Georgia, when they lost the Creek War, they fled to Florida in the Spanish territory. Um, and so Jackson's going to follow him down and lead a number of raids into Florida that would force the Spanish eventually to give that territory to the United States under what's known as the adams onis Treaty. Uh, but Jackson enters political society running as a Democrat. Um, and he really sort of embodies the Southern slaveholding interests of this time period. Um, and it's largely with uh, Jackson that we're going to see uh, the Democrats firmly become cemented as this party of the South, the party of the slaveholding class. Um, so he runs as a populist. This is how he positions himself. He says, I'm a common guy and I fight for the common people. Um, and he embraces this idea known as white man's democracy. Uh, and he's doing, he really pushes this idea forward all throughout his presidency, which runs from 1829 to 1837. 
White man's democracy is how Jackson is able to catapult himself into office uh, and into the national spotlight as a politician. Uh, what he says basically up until this point, just being a white male did not get you the right to vote. Uh, you had to be a land-owning male. Um, and so when Jackson comes into office, he says, this isn't fair to non-landowners, to, to people who don't actually own an estate. Um, and so what he does is he reaches out, basically he's going to be seen as a populist because he reaches out to the poor white classes, the non-land-owning males, white males in the United States. And he's going to extend voting rights to them. Um, and so this is really going to help uh, Andrew Jackson kind of get catapulted into office. This is really his stepping stone there, is that he pushes this idea that non-land-owning white males should also be able to vote um, universally across on a national level in the United States. Um, and so as part of his presidency, it's not just about giving these rights to free uh, non-land-owning white Americans, uh, but it's also about taking rights away from freed African Americans. He's going to start to step back the privileges and uh, citizenship rights and voting rights of freed African Americans throughout his presidency. Um, and so really, when we look at Andrew Jackson, he's uh, for a long time in American historiography, he was considered to be this great populist, this person who gave the common man the right to vote. But upon sort of revisiting the, his presidency, what we tend to see is that it's a very racialized version of universal suffrage for men. Um, African Americans suffer a loss of political privilege during this time, while non-landowning white males are gaining political privileges. Um, and so this is really kind of defining Jackson in his era. There's some other key terms that go along with Andrew Jackson as well that you see bolded out here on the lecture slide. The first is the spoil system. This is something that Jackson is going to use readily, and it tends to become associated with the Democratic Party throughout the rest of the 19th century. The spoil system it emerges under Jackson, uh, but this is where an elected party will use the promise of a specific office um, or a civil service job that pays very well and comes with a lot of respect in order to secure votes. Simply put, this is how this system works. Um, if I'm the Democratic president of the United States and I'm running for office again and I need votes here in Houston, I might come to someone who's politically influential in Houston and say, I'll make you my secretary of state if you make sure everybody in Houston votes for me. Um, and so this is a, a system in which it's kind of a, a pay to play sort of system that plays out in United States politics becomes very prominent under Jackson, and the Democrats are going to use this throughout the rest of the 19th century to try to gain votes and win national elections. Mm -hmm. um, the final key term associated with Jackson here is King Mob, um, and this ties back into how he wins office. He is given this nickname by his political opponents, um, and really it's meant to be an insult to Jackson, but he tends to embrace it. Uh, what a lot of the other politicians at the time saw Jackson doing is reaching out to uneducated, uncultured uh, people who are unfit to really vote for po politicians and for major national political offices. They say basically J what Jackson does, does is he reaches out to the lowest common denominator. He reaches out to the poorest people, the uneducated people, uh, and he riles them up to try and get their vote. So in other words, he is reaching out to these unwashed masses and getting them all riled up, and then they're voting for him. And that's how he's winning political office. Um, and so this is a nickname that's associated with Jackson throughout his time period, throughout his presidency. He has another nickname that has a lasting impact in American politics, uh, and that is his political opponents call him a jackass. Um, and so ultimately, this is why the donkey is now the symbol of the political party, of the Democrats, uh, because his political opponents said, you're a jackass. And basically, Jackson so, says, yeah, fine, you can call me a jackass, but I'm a jackass who wins elections. And so the idea of an ass or a donkey gets embraced as the symbol of the Democratic Party uh, back in Jackson's time. Um, and so this is, is going to have that sort of the imagery of the Democratic Party. Jackson sort of leaves his mark on that there during his presidency. Um, so 
as I mentioned, Jackson's uh, presidency is also associated with a very tough time for Native Americans. Uh, the Native Americans are, are going to be suffering big time under Jackson. He has no love for Native Americans, having fought against them in many wars, uh, the Seminole Wars, the Creek Wars, and the American South. Um, so when he comes into office, uh, he immediately passes in 1830 something known as the Indian Removal Act. This act requires all the Native Americans and also some freed African Americans in Florida who are living amongst the Seminole people to relocate from their traditional territories in the southeast, places like Georgia, Alabama, uh, the Carolinas. And it says you have to leave your traditional homelands and move west of the Mississippi River. The groups that this impacts the most are the Choctaw, the Cherokee, the Seminole, the Chickasaw and the Creek Native American groups. They're the ones who are really going to suffer under this. Uh, now, under the, this gives rise to this issue in American history known as the Trail of Tears. Uh, this is the forced migration of Native Americans from their homes in the southeast, west of the Mississippi River, under the Indian Removal Act. Um, and they're being watched by Southern militiamen. Basically, they're forced to march on foot. Some of them are going to travel by boat uh, through the riverways. But for the most part, they're being forced to migrate under the watch of Southern militias, who, if they tried to fight back or stop moving, uh, would ultimately shoot those people. Um, now, the Choctaw are going to be the first group of Native Americans removed under the Indian Removal Act and, and following what they call the Trail of Tears. They're being forced out in 1831. The Cherokee are a larger group that are able to resist the Indian Removal Act up until about 1838, uh, when finally they are going to be able to secure a deal with Washington, D.C., um, and they're being allowed to move on their own accord. They're not going to be forced to move under the watch of a militia. They're going to be moving on their own, but all of these Native Americans who are being forced to move are going to be moved to an area that back then and throughout most of the 19th century is referred to as Indian Territory. Um, today, we call that area Oklahoma. Um, and so this is why you tend to see a large preponderance of Native American tribes in Oklahoma. That's not their traditional homeland. It's just that's where they were forced to resettle after the Indian Removal Act and the Trail of Tears. Uh, now, the estimates on the death toll throughout this, this forced migration are somewhat unclear. There are a number uh, of uh, estimates, but it's usually right around 3,000. They think about 3,000 Native Americans died either as a result of being exposed to disease during this migration, exhaustion during the migration, starvation, dehydration. These are all factors. In addition to that, a lot of the young Native American males tried to stage resistances against the uh, Southern militias, and that generally didn't end well for them, and they would be uh, killed if that happened. Um, and so this is a very dark period of American history uh, when you're looking at it through a Native American lens. Um, this is seeing a large number of Native Americans forced to leave their traditional homelands. And many of these Native American groups have religious ties to the land that they live on. So that's a rather important point uh, to sort of grasp as well, is that this isn't just about, I got to leave my home and, and rebuild somewhere else. Uh, they, they are, look, their land is sacred to them, and they're being forced to remove themselves from it uh, and resettle in Oklahoma. So the final thing I'm going to talk about uh, before we get into the bulk of today's lecture, and I, I sort of switch over on videos, um, is the emergence of the Whig Party. This party comes about in the middle of the 19th century. They're forming around 1834. Um, and that date is important because the Whigs are, it's a political group way back in England. They're actually the group that came into power and signed the treaty that recognized America's independence in 1783. But they don't emerge in the United States until 1834. And that's because uh, they're formed together out of remnants of the old Democratic Republicans who have broken down. Uh, the Democratic end of that formed the Democratic Party, and the, the National Republicans became an opposition party. Uh, but it's formed out of that group and anti-Masonic groups. Uh, the Masons, are Freemasons, were a major group in the United States. They were kind of seen as uh, a contemporary Illuminati, for if you believe in those conspiracy theories today. They're seen as a group of these shady figures um, that would ultimately be wielding power behind the scenes and dictating how things are going to go in American lives. 
But there's a big wave of anti-Masonic sentiment in the middle of the 19th century. People are worried about what this secretive group is up to. Uh, But this party, as we'll see, will ultimately collapse under the pressure of slavery. What you really need to know about the Whigs. The Whigs come into, into existence in 1834 almost solely in opposition to Andrew Jackson. Um, So they are the leading voice of opposition to the Democrats in the mid-19th century, Um, and they're uh, they're really going to sort of position themselves in most places as being against slavery and slave ownership. Um, Really, they focus heavily on the development of infrastructure and issues of moral reform such as temperance, something we already talked about. But really what they're all about is they are totally in opposition to Andrew Jackson and his policies. So if you're following along in the slideshow, you can go to the next slide and see how the Whigs saw Andrew Jackson. They see him as this uh, wannabe monarch, this wannabe king, uh, who will go in and take over. And basically, as you can see in the picture on the right, sit on a pile of skulls of those he's vanquished. Um, And so this is how they see Andrew Jackson as... He reaches out to the the people who shouldn't be voting anyway to get in power, and then he manipulates the system for his own ends. He's trying to make himself more powerful than he actually should be as a president. Um, And so the Whigs are going to be born out of this opposition to Jackson, and they're going to remain the party of political opposition with the Democrats from about 1834 up until the election of 1848, when they start to sort of diminish on the national stage. That will wrap up this mini lecture right here, and we'll pick it back up with the next one talking about our main subject, which is slavery and sectionalism in the mid-19th century.